recording. Welcome to Tuesday, September 16th, Math 261, the Serve Vector Calculus class session. And today I want to do a couple of examples. We're going to use quadric surfaces once or twice today. We're going to show you an interesting intersection example. And you're working on an intersection problem right now in your homework. And I thought I could show you how a different one is done, a much different one. And I'll give you some more capabilities in Mathematica. So I want to encourage you to experiment more and more in Mathematica. And you're going to use it more and more as we go on. You know slowly ramping up and this will give you some ideas of things you could explore we've stuck to the rectangular coordinate system almost exclusively so far but there are other coordinate systems we can use and two classical coordinate systems that are commonly used are spherical and cylindrical coordinates for good reasons now there are many, many coordinate systems we could employ. And then part of our responsibility is, well, if we could do calculations in the rectangular coordinate system, can we do the same calculus calculations in a spherical coordinate system and a cylindrical coordinate system in another coordinate system? Well, motion doesn't change depending on how you describe the motion, right? The baseball is flying on the same path, whether you describe it with respect to this coordinate system or that coordinate system. So all the calculations we do on the path of the baseball have to remain the same result, but they might look different. And the reason why you move into different coordinate systems is potentially one coordinate system or another might present your calculations or your description in an easier fashion. Okay, this will mark the end of chapter two. And then we'll finally begin to do calculus with curves in space. And it's gonna be our first massive calculus victory in space, but it'll take us several days. It's chapter two, and now we begin chapter three. So we'll just do an introduction to what we're gonna do with curves in space, maybe a couple of basic calculations. Okay, so here we go. I want to take you to the website and I want to point out a couple of things to you. And then I think we'll do an example of quadric surfaces intersecting in Mathematica. So I'm going to share a website with you right now as I can find it. So here we are. We're in week three. We're finishing week three. And we're gonna to start to get into a rhythm. Uh, I did have a question on the homework you submitted on Tuesday. Someone looked in their Google Drive folder, which, you know, thank you very much, and said they didn't see the grade for the homework. I update those as soon as I get things graded. And whenever I put a graded paper or a grade report in your Google folder, I will send a short note to the group like, Folder has been updated with your current grades and graded homework. So I haven't finished reading the homework you gave on Tuesday and I'll finish that sometime, possibly later tonight. And then I'll update you. Then you'll submit another exercise. So every time I update that folder or finish grading a paper, I will notify you by a group email. So what we're working on, we talked a little bit about quadric surfaces last time. Quadric surfaces are the fundamental surfaces in space. They're the basic building blocks in space. They are what happens if you try to look at the collections of the points that satisfy any algebraic equation of degree two. The algebraic equation of degree one is a plane, ax plus by plus cz equals d. But if you allow second powers of x, y, and z, if you allow x times y, y times z, x times z, if you allow degree two terms, then you ask yourself reasonably, well, what are the, all the animals I could create there? 
and they are the quadric surfaces, which can be classified many ways, but common way of classifying them is into the cylinders, the ellipsoids, and the hyperboloids. A full treatment of the quadric surfaces would also consist of how to rotate them and translate them. Translating is not a big deal, and our first example will show you that, but rotating them requires a little more calculation and machinery. And there are fancy ways you can rotate them with the calculus tools you have so far, but they tend to be overworking. Uh, too much magic, too much calculation, not enough understanding. If you want a full treatment of how you can rotate conic sections or quadric surfaces, then really you want to talk about coordinate systems in general. And that's most easily dealt with in a linear algebra class. So there might be a day you take a linear algebra class and then you would see rotation of the conics as if you were redoing calculus or rotation of the quadric surfaces. But there are good reasons why you want to organize quadric surfaces in a rotated form. Uh, a very simple example, which I'm not gonna show you a picture of is, let's say you had a cloud of three dimensional data and you could ask questions like line of best fit for data in the plane. You could say plane of best fit possibly for data in space, but you might also want to wrap that data in a cloud, wrap that data in elliptical cloud. So try that instead of a line of best fit in the plane. But that elliptical cloud won't be parallel to the x, y, and z axis necessarily. It might be rotated, distorted. And then you'd like to know the coordinate system where that object naturally lives. So there's lots of things you have yet to discover. We only present the quadric surfaces here as the basic building blocks of space. Cylindrical and spherical coordinates we present because we want you to be open-minded that some things might be easier to calculate or present in other coordinate systems. There's literally infinitely many other coordinate systems you can invent. And usually when you're presented with an object, if you don't have a classical coordinate system, rectangular, spherical, or cylindrical, that does the job, you usually invent a coordinate system, a hyperbolic coordinate system, a parabolic coordinate system, whatever does the job or makes the calculation easier. And finally, we're gonna open up chapter three, talk about vector valued functions and curves in space. So we're gonna finally extend our calculation and our calculus weapons to space. Now you're working on a homework that's due tonight, 356 Alt. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And then you have some other things posted. Uh, this problem from 256, uh, 26, 356, 413. This is somewhat challenging problems, not necessarily obvious answers. I just want you to play with it, discover it. You're free to ask questions, but uh, they're not things that you're going to snap out in five minutes necessarily. Among our handouts, uh, I don't know if you've checked into our formula sheets here, but these formula sheets are things that we're going to collect as time goes on. Now, some of them relate to what we're doing today, but more of them relate to the calculus we're about to do. So as we work through chapter three, you'll see that many of the things we're doing, we've collected on formula sheet one just to help you organize yourself. If we were in a face-to-face -face classroom and you were taking an exam, I usually like to run things by presenting a class formula sheet. Not everybody has their own formula sheet. Mine's better than yours. You get into all kinds of envy situations. No, let's give everybody the same formulas. And this is a class where I can't just say to you, oh, the only thing we've done is the quadratic formula. So you can look at these two formula sheets to start to check off the things we've worked on. 
Uh, as you prepare for exams, and we might talk about exams later, I've collected some former exam problems or some sample problems I've used in the past. And I presented them as folders here. The folders are just zipped up folders of problems. So problems and solutions in a folder, and then I compressed the file so that you could download it simply. So here's some useful vector and curve practice problems. If you click on that and download it, then you can open it on your machine. Sample exam problems similarly. Finishing up lines, planes, and distance. You want to practice some distance problems. Here's some dot product consequences. These are actual problems with the solution attached to them afterwards, so you can look at them. Uh, I have some cross product ideas I'm trying to develop, but I haven't really finished developing that. So that's kind of a placeholder I'm working on. More distance and intersection problems presented and then presented with a solution so that you can practice that blank and then look at the solution. Some more distance problems, line and plane equation problems. Uh, more distance problems. Somehow I think uh, that's a copy but I'm not gonna look at that right now, excuse me. Parallel of pipe heads are really interesting. And so I thought I'd show you two images right here. And parallel pipe heads are gonna be critical to the things we do in the future. You know, the dot product of the cross product is the box product. And there's a reason why it's called a box product because it presents a box. So when you think about a parallel of pipe head, really you're thinking about a sheared rectangle. And the sheared rectangle looks something like this. How do you recognize the volume of a sheared rectangle? A sheared box. So if you've looked at this, fine. If you haven't, just run it by you quickly here. Here I take a sheared rectangular box. And I want to show you that its volume is its length times its width times its height. The measurements of the edges. And maybe that's not obvious. Well, you're gonna look at this drawing really carefully on your own time, but you say if I sliced off one pyramid off the edge and moved it to the other edge, well, now I've taken one of the directions of shear away. Instead of having a box sheared in two directions, sheared means bent over, like tilting a tower of coins or a tower of cards of a deck. It's a force that's being applied to that object that's bent it out of shape. So if I slice off one side of it, one pyramid and bring it to the other side, then I've taken away one direction of shear, and then I slice off the front of that box. I take away another direction of shear. And you see that I end up with a classical right angled box. And that length times width times height is obviously its volume. And then if you realize that you neither created nor destroyed material along the way, the volume of this box, length times width times height, must also be the volume of this box, length times width times height. You also know the volume of that box is the dot product of the cross product of the three vectors that you can draw from one corner of the box. So that's two representations of what that box looks like. The other thing that I wanted you to see, which is hinted at in a problem, but it's not entirely obvious, is the idea that any parallelopiped can be decomposed into six tetrahedra of equal volume. Now that takes a little bit of drawing to see and it's a little bit of mathematics to demonstrate. So I'm not demonstrating it for you here. I just wanna show you a picture to show you how you could think about it, how it might be conceptually possible. So again, this is presented on my screen in a recording, very two-dimensional, three-dimensional object. 
I think you might print this out and look at it yourself, but I just thought I'd draw this for you so you could see it once. If you concentrate on this object right here, and I might be able to draw on the object. Okay, let's try it. What I could say is here's a parallel pipe head formed by a vector here and a vector here. And then a vector on the back side, which I'll try and marginally succeed to draw as dashed. Sometimes you draw things dashed to represent they're in the background. Okay, so maybe you can visualize this parallel pipette right here formed by these three vectors. You name them U, V, and W, but I'm not going to try to draw letters. It would look horrible. But now consider, for example, the tetrahedron that connects the three arrowheads and the point of origin of the three arrows, the point of origin of the three vectors. That's a tetrahedron, a four vertice object inside the parallelopiped. What volume of the parallelopiped does that tetrahedron represent? I'll draw the remaining sides of this tetrahedron. Again, it takes me a second to draw the dashed ones that are in the background. And I'm going to erase this drawing in a second. But there's a four sided, four vertice figure that's inside my parallel pipe. Well, what volume of the parallel pipe does that occupy? It occupies one sixth of the volume. And when you draw a tetrahedron in here, you're going to get one sixth of the parallel pipe under a certain condition. How do I know that's exactly one sixth of the parallel pipe? Well, it takes two steps. If you concentrate and draw the remaining parallel pipe heads, and there's more than one way to do it, you can count that I have six parallel pipe heads in this figure one in the upper, one in the lower back, one in the lower front, and that's exactly half. And then here's one in the upper front, one in the upper forward, and one in the back. There's more than one way to decompose a parallel pipette into six tetrahedrons. But I'm going to start to undo some of the clutter. If you think about it carefully, though, and none of these tetrahedrons are exactly the same shape, but they are all exactly the same volume. So set this as an exercise to yourself. How do you know that these six tetrahedra are exactly the same volume? That's how we conclude that one parallel pipette is made out of six equal volume tetrahedras. Think about that, see what you can accomplish. But in order to help you, what I did try to do here is draw very carefully. And if you print this out, I've even color coded the tetrahedra. If you think you can explain it, uh, send me a note or meet up with me in the office hour and tell me how you see the six tetrahedra of equal volume. Okay, so parallel pipettes are going to be very important to us in the future. That's why I present you with these two images. Okay, you've already looked at quadric surfaces a little bit. You can, here's a handout that summarizes the formats of the quadric surfaces. Uh, you have our class sessions, recommended problems that you ask for, I post. If you ask for some, I post them. You've asked some good ones, but you haven't asked any recently. And then videos otherwise that you should watch about the cauchy schwartz triangle, direction cosines, intersection of two planes, and then some other technology that we'll demonstrate. Uh, I had questions about assembling multiple PDF documents into one PDF document, so I posted to the group. And here I have links to some programs like Microsoft Lens, Apple Notes, Adobe Scan. Uh, I think Apple Notes is the best of these. Microsoft Lens is not bad. I'm not a super duper fan of Adobe Scan and Adobe's product logic in general. 
I want to look at one of these mathematical sheets here. Let's look at the sheet called intersecting cylinders. Again, remember when you click on one of these, you go to a Google Drive. Uh, I don't want to sign into the Google Drive right now, so I'm going to pass on that. You shouldn't have to sign into this. It's just the way I have my browser set up right now. So you'll go to a Google Drive. You can download this to your system and then look at the same things we're going to look at here, but I'm going to open it on my own desktop. I'm trying to give you some tips about this problem that you're working on, depending on what you've done in it, using Mathematica to draw these two quadric surfaces, see the intersection and see if you can draw the intersection. That's what I'm trying to give you some insight into. So I'm going to open up this intersecting cylinders here, and then I'll share that with you. First of all, I have to find it. Let me see if that's the copy I want to look at. Mm-hmm, that'll do. Sometimes I'll do this, and you'll see this when I'm sharing a page with you. So I'm going to stop that share and move to this Mathematica worksheet. Let me get rid of some of these images so they don't distract us when we first discuss. And then let me maybe raise this type size a little bit. And if that's too much, I'll lower it. So let me look at two cylinders. I'll write them on our paper so we can go back and forth as necessary. Intersecting cylinders. And one of them is x squared plus y squared equals four. And one of them is x minus one squared plus z squared equals one. I go to our paper just so you can see these in general first. You recognize both of these as cylinders. They would be circles or ellipses in the xy plane or in the xz plane, right? But this x squared plus y squared equals four, which is a circle in the xy plane, if you consider it in space and z is free to go anywhere it wants, that means I take this circle and slide up and down the z axis. So a circle of radius two in the tabletop, sliding up and down the z axis. This with missing y is a circle in the xz plane. Sorry, this is the x, this is the z, this is the y. But it's a circle of radius one that's been offset by one unit in the x direction. So it's a circle not centered at the origin, but brought forward on the x direction by one unit. Maybe I'll use a different color to draw this. It's radius one, so it's thinner than this first cylinder, but let's say it's like this, and then sliding along the y-axis. So I have a straw that's intersecting a toilet paper roll. What does that intersection look like? And can I visualize it in any more intelligent way than this? Well, it, it, might, it might strike that cylinder, but since the cylinder is tilting, bending, the intersection place is not gonna be a raw circle. It's gonna be some kind of deformed circle. And me drawing wiggles on this paper is not gonna help you see it any better unless I draw a very accurate, very large image. Well, let's go to a tool that can draw a very accurate, very large image. So 
I've prepared this worksheet for you to look at and to illustrate some special tool that I can use in Mathematica. I haven't proofread everything here. Originally, I used the worksheet that demonstrated the cylinder intersecting the sphere. And that's not what's happening in this worksheet. So I didn't take out that reference as I should. I'll eliminate that, but it still exists on the one in our repository. Let's graph these two cylinders with a contour plot, 3D. And again, what I'm gonna do is define two variables and then bring the two variables together in a picture. So this looks very busy, but let me explain all the options we're using right here. So cylinder equals, cylinder one equals, that means I'm creating a variable called cylinder one, cylinder two equals, a variable called cylinder two. What is this variable? Is it four, is it seven, is it X minus nine? No, this variable is a plot structure. It's using a contour plot. And we'll talk about maybe why I prefer contour plot here later. But I just want to put in the raw equation, x squared plus y squared equals four. Notice the double equals because that's a mathematical equals. Notice the single equals here, that's a variable assignment. I did not use colon equals this time. And I typed in the name of that cylinder, the equation of that cylinder, and the equation of the offset horizontal cylinder. Then I created a viewing window for X and Y and Z. It looks busy, but I can create a specific viewing window for X and Y and Z. I use the same viewing window for both of these because I've looked at the problem and selected something that's good, but this gives me fine control over the viewing window. I've added another option called axes label. What this does is it's gonna write X, Y, and Z on the boxes I create along the X, Y, and Z axis. And that way you're gonna get a little bit of orientation because just looking at a raw twisting box is kind of awkward. In these two lines, contour style and mesh, I talk about how I want that cylinder to look. And here you have a lot of freedom and you can draw this without these two lines, but I want the shading of this contour, the shading of the surface to be green and to be 25% transparent, whatever 25% transparent means, the opacity. So I gave the command a directive to make the shading of the cylinder Transparent to that degree and green. Mesh equals none means I don't wanna draw a grid on this cylinder. I don't think it matters one way or the other, but we'll give it a shot. Plot points controls how well the cylinder is plotted. The more points I use, the smoother this picture will look like, but the more intense the calculations will be. So I can actually ask Mathematica to do more calculations, but I got to be careful with that because it costs time and memory. And I'll do similarly for cylinder two. Not quite as transparent, going to be red. Let's give it 20 points. Now let's look at these two objects. Here's cylinder one. I can rotate it in space, but I see the X, Y, and Z on the axes. It's fairly transparent. I can look through the top of it. This is kind of a reasonable representation. Notice if I said plot points 10, it would look just barely a little more rough. You can't see that if I went down quite a bit. Now you see that this is noticeably polygonal. So it draws it faster, but it draws it less smoothly. Uh, 30, I don't think gives me much better quality, but it takes a little more time. I think I'll go back to 20. Okay, I could mess with the mesh style. I think I'll do that on the next one. Cylinder two looks like this. Here I kept the grid lines on the cylinder. This is the straw that's gonna poke through the toilet paper roll. You see the X, Y, Z here. 
I don't have any central axes, but you see where the axes are. I could add axes if I want to draw that. I want to show you two other things about a general command right here. Remember, if I said colon equals, what I would be doing is storing this in the variable cylinder and displaying it later. So I would lose the display here. Another way to suppress output in Mathematica is to use a semicolon at the end of a line. If you use the semicolon at the end of a line, Mathematica does what you ask it to, but it suppresses the output. So in both these cases, I didn't need the output. Why do I not need the output? Because I'm gonna combine them right now with the show command. <coughs> so I've defined two cylinders. What do they look like together? Show cylinder one, cylinder two, and label the axes to help us get oriented. So here's cylinder one and cylinder two. You see them intersecting. And I can rotate one direction or the other. It looks like the thin cylinder is just on the edge of the large cylinder. The shading helps, the mesh helps, but I'm really interested in what's this curve of intersection along these lines. But before I do that, let me show you another dimension that's very, very cool. What happens if I wanna move the red straw in this picture? I'd like to take the red straw and slide it in and out of this cylinder. Remember this red straw is already offset by one unit, right? So instead of the previous cylinder description, which was x minus one squared plus z squared equals one. What if I create a new cylinder description? Let's call it cylinder three, but now let's make it a function of a parameter a. Okay, so to define a function, I have to use the square brackets. I have to name the variables and I have to put an underscore after the name of the variables. We could talk about the technical word for this later, but it's basically reserving that letter for Mathematica say, this letter is going to be the variable in this function. I use colon equals so that it's not evaluated right away. I'm just assigning this plot structure to this function. Now, notice the difference. Above, I assigned a plot structure to a variable. Now I am making a plot structure a function. And for every different A, I'll get a different plot structure. I could likewise define a curve description as a function of A. So I worked out, and you can review this and see how I did this. You can test this yourself. I worked out what the curves of intersection would be, a little bit like I'm asking you to do on your homework problem, except the curve of intersection on your homework problem is a little fancier than the one I've presented here. But I want to display the curve of intersection of those two cylinders as a function of A, so that I can show you as the cylinders slide in and out, the curve will be marked with them. So to draw a curve, I use a parametric plot command, open square bracket, close square bracket at the end. I just do this so that I could easily insert the commands and options. I have to display those circles in two parts because essentially when one straw intersects toilet paper roll, there'll be two intersection surfaces for some moments. I need to use a certain amount of time, zero to pi. I can parameterize circles and ellipses with that. And I want this curve to show up clearly. So the plot style, it's a parametric plot, not a contour plot. So I call plot style and I give it the instructions. Draw this blue and this thick. Draw this blue and this thick. The thickness here is not measured in linear units on a ruler, but it's measured in pixel units. So you could experiment with this. Notice this is colon equals. So when I hit return, shift return on both of these, I see no results because I'm just defining functions. 
Now let's look at the cool wicked weapon called manipulate. I'll get rid of this error message for a second. Manipulate is Mathematica's way of animating things. Remember cylinder three and curve are functions that draw a new plot structure for every value of A. Cylinder one was just the toilet paper roll green vertical. So when I say manipulate this show command, let me take this show command outside and let me show you the value of the show command at zero time. That'll draw me one image of the red cylinder intersecting the green cylinder with the intersection lines highlighted. Notice the intersection lines are not circles because they live on both cylinders. So it's kind of elliptical in that direction, circular in that direction, and hyperbolic in that direction. But what would be it worth to you if instead of just showing you one intersection at a time, zero, let's show you the intersection at 0 0.5. Okay, it's slightly moved over and these circles are slightly distorted, but it's still a circle in this direction, an ellipse in this direction. I don't know if these are hyperbolas in this direction anymore, but they have some hyperbolic qualities. I could show you images like this one at a time for the next 30 minutes, right? But how about just telling Mathematica to create an animation where it runs through all these images for different values of A. So let's get rid of this. Let's execute this command with a manipulate. Manipulate command in mathematics is very powerful. And it renders it pretty quickly. And it gives me what I looked like I had before, but now I have the slider A. And the slider A moves that straw in and out of that green cylinder. Now, the only creative thing I did here was I had to work out the equations of those two blue curves, right? Which is a little bit like what you're doing. Now, notice here, the two blue curves actually join into one rubber band. That's kind of interesting. So what is the power of the manipulate? The power of the manipulate here is to show me the different qualities of that intersection. Here, the straw is just carving into the green toilet paper roll. Here, the straw may be just touching the green toilet paper roll. I don't know if I can manipulate that beautifully with my finger. If I hit this plus sign, I see the value of A that's being presented here. I can animate that by hitting the play button. I can slow down or speed up. I can run this backwards and forwards. Let me slow it down quite a bit. Uh, this is not a complicated animation. So it's coming across to you. Now, here's a problem. I'm doing an animating, which is in a video, which is in a recording, which is on the internet, right? Lots of slowing down in there. But this is not a complicated video in the computational sense. And so Mathematica, the whole process looks relatively smooth. It's not beautiful, but it's relatively smooth. Okay, let me stop this animation. And all I wanted to do was give you a feeling for how you could seriously, seriously ramp things up in Mathematica. You're not gonna do this on UTI Inspire. You're not going to do this on your TI-84. You're not going to do this on your slide rule. Although if I had my choice, slide rule would be the weapon of choice for me. This doesn't replace your thinking, but it does help validate your thinking and it does help give you insights into things. So defining a plot structure, 
Showing multiple plots together can be really helpful. But you can define commands to create plots that vary with time or some other parameter. And then you can bring those plots together in a manipulate structure. We might do this once in a while. That offers great insight. So this is the intersecting cylinders worksheet. You see at the top of my page, it says intersecting cylinders copy possibly. And the reason for that is uh, I didn't want to uh, dirty the original I had. So I just opened a copy of it here on my desktop. I've already mentioned this once, but I'm going to mention it again by sharing my screen. Now I'm sharing the entire screen. And the purpose of sharing the entire screen is so that I can remind you that the Wolfram documentation is extraordinarily excellent. So if you wanted to learn something about the manipulate command, you would go to the Wolfram documentation and hit manipulate. And they would give you complete description, but more powerful, it would give you examples that you could play with yourself. Uh, I'm sure he's got some 2D and 3D examples here, but I'm not going to go through all the different things they demonstrate. So Mathematica has a learning curve. You don't have to learn it all at once. You learn a little bit at once, and I help you. But it's absolutely worth learning. It's absolutely necessary as you continue. Let me stop that sharing. Let me go back to my website and share one more thing before we go back to our paper and do calculations. <laughs> I want to go back to my website. Here we go. Uh, just to give you an example of how much juice Mathematica has compared to a Desmos or something like that. Here's a similar representation of that problem in Desmos. Projections of intersecting cylinders. But it's really not satisfying. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a demonstration of part of this. Here's the green cylinder, the red cylinder. Uh, I had to do some fancy setup to get that. I'm only representing how things work. I do have some animation. So you can actually see that two blue rubber bands becoming one blue rubber band. But here what I'm doing is presenting the three projections along the X, Y, and Z axis collapsed onto this plane. So now I start to intersect, have a little circle. The, the cylinder, the horizontal cylinder, actually, I reversed the colors here. Sorry about that. The horizontal cylinder, which was red in the previous image, is now green, and green is now red. Now, the cylinder enters the larger cylinder and pinches off. Now it's inside entirely, so I have two intersection curves. You know, you can clear away distracting objects and just focus on the intersecting curves. Okay, so give Desmos a gold star. It does some interesting things, right? You can do quite a lot with Desmos, but this does not compare to that 3D manipulation we did a second ago. Okay, so use all your tools, but you don't have the luxury of saying, I don't need to learn Mathematica. You need to learn slowly how to use this. Okay, where am I gonna go with this? So I just wanna do that one example there for you. Let's work on spherical and cylindrical coordinates now. So I'm gonna go backwards, I'm gonna get out of here. That looks terrible, doesn't it? Thankfully, you weren't born 200 years ago where this is all you could do. Well, if you were an artist, you could do better. But think how pitiful this looks compared to what we just did in Mathematica. Okay, now let's look at spherical, if I can spell it. Spherical and cylindrical coordinates. You do have some analogy already in the plane built, and you're familiar with this. I mean, if you think about it, rectangular coordinates are extremely awkward. 
They're good for describing equations in a very basic sense, but no one really thinks or works in rectangular coordinates when they're doing real life movement, right? Now you give me some silly example like, oh yes, if I wanna go from 52nd Street to 51st Street, I'm gonna go over two streets and I'm gonna go up one street. Okay, city blocks, as you lay them out from above, might be in rectangular coordinates. Um, very few cities actually are. But you're used to specifying locations in terms of horizontal and vertical position because that's effective, it's quick. But you also learned that you could specify locations by distance and angle from the horizontal. And these were called polar coordinates. R and theta, these are rectangular coordinates. Now there's a very simple way to translate between them. And so simple, I don't really want you to memorize formulas. I want you to remember always this picture. This picture you probably have glued in your mind from several different math classes. That the relationship between r and theta and x and y is coded in this picture. x squared plus y squared produces r squared. Or if you like to just look at r itself, x squared plus y squared equals r after you square root it. And the tangent of theta is y over x. Or if you wanted to simply talk about theta, you could say tan inverse of y over x. And so if I give you x and y, you can clearly produce r and theta with these two formulas. Likewise, if I give you r and theta, you can clearly produce x and y with these two formulas. Uh, polar coordinates themselves were a type of uh, toy. You didn't use them too much except in trigonometry. You could talk about motion in the plane in the sense that you live on a flat earth or what we essentially experience as a flat earth. So you can talk about the distances the crow flies from this point to that point. But really, if you admit it, you're actually living in three-dimensional space. So you use cylindrical, you use the polar coordinates in a very casual way in trigonometry when you assume that all fields were perfectly flat and things like that. So you were describing the surveying of a field. But now we can pump these things up to space. So let's take a point in space along the x, y, and z axes. And I'm gonna casually use x, y, and z as the names of the axes. But also the name of this point. So let's call this point right here X and Y and Z. And let's see how we could use, extend polar coordinates to space. It's not too hard to imagine. I could draw the same triangle that I just drew before. X and Y and R. I could draw this triangle up here, but I could draw it on the tabletop and show you in perspective that I've drawn it on the tabletop x, y, and r. Locate theta in this drawing, and you got right here. So instead of saying x and y, I could describe that point with the theta that I turn from the horizontal x-axis, the positive x-axis, and the r that I go out from the origin, 
and then the Z that I ride up in the elevator. And if I specify the name of that point by R theta and Z, those are called cylindrical coordinates. In cylindrical coordinates, I replace X with R cosine theta. I replace Y with R sine theta. And I can convert Z. I use the same Z as I used before. Z just stands for the number of floors I rode up in this elevator. Sometimes this is used in a robotic sense, like I want you to turn an angle and then raise your robotic arm up here. But again, this is a little bit artificial because it's a kind of a marriage of the rectangular coordinates, which are kind of entirely inefficient in three-dimensional space, and the polar coordinates, which are kind of making the X and Y slightly more efficient. But if I want to erase this reference to Z, if I want to erase this reference to the elevator, and I want to move as I move in real life, and I'll give you a visual demonstration of this in a second. How do I really move in real life? I have my hand right here, and the can of soup is on the shelf here. I do not. You know, my wife says, can you grab me that can of soup? I don't move my hand X units and then Y units and then up Z units. Think how silly that would look. No, here's my hand. Here's a can of soup. I just reach out and grab the can of soup, right? How far do I reach? Well, that's the distance from the origin. Now, distance from the origin in the plane I called R, so I can't reuse R. Let's use a Greek R. Let's use another letter. Let's call this letter rho. Rho could be distance from the origin. Notice with the Z and the R and the rho, I've completed another right triangle. Except this right triangle is standing up on the tabletop. Take those two right triangles out and lay them down because it's very important that you can visualize these right triangles. The one that relates x, y to r theta. And then, right angle, the one that relates r and z to rho. And likewise, this is a right angle. But I want to describe one of these angles. When I specify this one angle and this right angle, notice I've got all three angles right here. Theta, 90, 90 minus theta. So specifying this theta right here is enough to finish describing the whole triangle. Three sides, three angles. Right here, I have three sides, R, Z, rho but I only have one angle. I want to specify the other angle and I'm gonna do it in a kind of an odd way. I could say angle from the plane, but I'm rather gonna say, it's more common to say angle from the vertical. How far do you bend down from the vertical? And this angle is traditionally called phi, Greek letter phi. Now, if you concentrate on this triangle, putting a phi in this corner puts a phi in the upper corner of this triangle. And now I can describe any point in space by doing what? Specifying the angle I turn in the plane, specifying the distance I want to shoot out and the angle I want to bend down from the vertical. 
rho, theta, and phi. Phi is the angle I bend down from the vertical. Theta is the angle I turn from the positive x-axis. And rho is the distance I go from the origin to the point. These are called spherical coordinates. You can translate from any one of these to any other by simply using these two triangles. And I want you to notice something else. Do you see how the cylindrical coordinates, and then we're gonna take a break shortly, share a Z. So all I concentrate on is translating R theta into X and Y or vice versa. Do you notice in spherical coordinates, spherical and cylindrical share the theta. And I just need to translate R and Z into rho and phi. Well, who translates R and Z into rho and phi? This triangle. So before I take a break, I just wanna give you kind of a simple demonstration and I don't know how this is going to come out really as like going on the stage or performing in a theater. Let me go to the whiteboard here. And they get a trusted Rubik's cube. Well, I guess that doesn't work. And I guess I don't have quite the object I want to have here. So This is not perfect demonstration that I wanted, but I'm gonna use my post-it note. I'm gonna put the post-it note on the whiteboard. Okay, here's my hand. I gotta turn this around so I can see what I'm showing you. Here's my hand. Here's the post-it note on the whiteboard. And notice that I'm a certain distance away horizontally. I'm a certain distance away translationally and a certain distance away in height. So remember, when someone asks me for the can of soup on the shelf, my wife says, can you grab that can of soup? I would look like complete foolish if I went, oh yeah, I'll get you that soup, honey. Got it. You know, that's rectangular. And that's only convenient because that's the way you've learned to write equations. But no one reaches for a can of soup on the shelf by going like that. Likewise, you don't reach for the can of soup by saying, up the elevator, right? That's cylindrical. Turn, travel, up the elevator. Now, if someone says, get the can of soup, you do what? You go straight for the can of soup, right? You go straight from the origin to the can of soup. That's spherical, okay? That's a silly demonstration. But I want you to acknowledge that the way you've learned to organize things in rectangular coordinates might have been convenient for calculating, but it's not necessarily convenient for moving around in real life. That's why we need other coordinate systems. Okay, I want you to take five. I want to stretch my legs. I want you to stretch your legs. I'm going to mute my microphone, but then I'll come back and maybe we'll do a demo of moving from one coordinate system to another, translating from one coordinate system to another and see how that's effectively done in real problem. Okay, I mute my microphone, I stretch my legs. You're welcome to do the same. Let's come back at uh, 9.08.
Okay, we're back and let's look at some conversion examples. Here I've presented some figures in space. And if you concentrate on them really hard, you could tell what coordinate system each one is using just by the names of the variables, right? But can you convert to the other coordinate systems? Can you recognize what these objects are? You know, the first one, because you are so indoctrinated into rectangular coordinates, you probably recognize the first one right away. I'm not sure what the second one is. This looks mysterious. So I want you to have some facility to go back and forth between the coordinate systems, right? So anytime someone gives you something in one coordinate system, you should be able to describe it in the other coordinate systems. It doesn't mean it's easy to describe or convenient. In fact, it might be entirely inconvenient. Uh, your homework problem is something of an example of that but it can be described in the other coordinate systems. And then there's something I'm saying that's not ringing true to you. And you're saying, okay, Dave, if rectangular coordinates is so screwed up, why did we learn calculus in them in the first place? If cylindrical or spherical or polar coordinates was so much better, why didn't we learn calculus in polar coordinates? You did in a way when you drew those funny curves and you did area calculations in the plane and polar coordinates. But rectangular coordinates are really efficient for calculating because the change along each value x and y, or now x and y and z, is along a straight line. So the reason you present many calculations in rectangular coordinates is because you can concentrate on one direction at a time, which is actually an advantage. Still, the other coordinate systems might be useless, uh, useful, not useless, for any slip there. And so we want to show you how to adjust. So how do I translate between any coordinate system to the other? It's literally these two triangles. These two triangles are the Rosetta stones of the coordinate systems. So for example, this is clearly rectangular coordinates because it uses X, Y, and Z. So let's travel through the rectangular coordinates to the cylindrical coordinates through this triangle because this triangle relates X, Y, R, and theta. It'll lim eliminate the X and Y. But you know that X squared plus Y squared is the same as R squared from this triangle. And now, r squared equals z squared, or r squared plus z squared equals four, is in cylindrical coordinates. It's not gonna take much to go from there to spherical coordinates because from this green triangle, you see that r squared plus z squared is rho squared. So now rho squared is four, or rho, which represents distance from the origin is plus or minus two. Now, from the beginning, you knew that this was a sphere radius two, but isn't it a little more poetic or beautiful to say a sphere of radius two is rho equals two? That's kind of a simpler presentation than this. And maybe the only reason you slightly favor this one still is because you were grown up taught rectangular coordinates but the cylindrical coordinates was slightly simpler. Spherical coordinates is much simpler in this case. Let's try this one right here. We have what looks like to be R's and thetas and Z's. Well, that must be cylindrical coordinates. Sorry, I had to slide the paper up and down, which I won't do because it will make you dizzy. These are cylindrical coordinates. How do we go to rectangular coordinates. So you basically slide through these two triangles. So when you have cylindrical, you naturally want to go to rectangular, but you can take the R and Z to go to spherical. 
Let's go to rectangular first. Let's write z plus, I'm going to have to use a little trig identity, r squared, cosine two theta is cosine squared theta, minus sine squared theta, right? And this is z plus r cos theta squared. I'm going to simplify that in one step, minus r sine theta squared. And what does this look like to you? r cos theta is x. x over r is cosine theta. You write that down if you need to look at it. x over r is cosine theta. So x is the same as r cos theta. So this is z plus x squared. Here's a subtract y squared equals zero. Now I have rectangular coordinates, or maybe if I write this in terms of z, rectangular coordinates right here. Either way you want to present this. This is a parabola in the z, y plane and a parabola in the z, x plane, but oppositely directed. So in the z, x plane, a parabola upside down. In the z, y plane, a parabola right side up. None. And I am not going to draw this worth anything. It is a hyperbolic paraboloid. Now here's, here's where I need a drawing machine, right? I can know what this is because I've done it before. If I did not know what this is, I think I need a machine to help me draw it. And now that I know what it is, and I've seen a drawing a hundred times, I still draw a very bad drawing. I'm trying to draw some kind of saddle, saddle surface potato chip. Let's go spherical. Now to go spherical, I think I'm going to get rid of theta. No, I keep theta. I need to get rid of z and r. So let's let this expression right here. Z, what is z? z over rho is the cosine of phi. And r over rho is the sine of phi. Notice phi is tucked into this upper angle right here. So this gives me a way to get rid of z, rho cos phi, and to get rid of r, rho sine phi. And then I could get rid of the z and r, and then I'd have rho, phi, and theta. That would be spherical, but I don't know if it's beautiful. First of all, I'll just write it down. z becomes rho, cosine phi, r becomes rho sine phi, we square r, and then we have cosine of two theta. I will not expand that with the trig identity yet. <coughs> Let's look at this object. This is certainly spherical coordinates, you know, congratulations. But I don't know if this gives me any insight into what this looks like at all. Could I clean this up by manipulating? You know, maybe, 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 maybe. But uh, I'm not sure that I can make this look any better with any simple steps. I could try the cosine squared minus sine squared. I could try to bring things together, right? But I don't think I'm gonna make this look necessarily any easier. The only thing that really strikes me is I have a row squared and a row. So maybe I could factor out a row or something like that, but I don't think that's necessarily gonna help me. Okay, I went to spherical, didn't create anything helpful. Here I went to spherical, got a beautiful poetic short description. I just want you to be able to concentrate on moving between them 
you don't always get something entirely useful. I do think rectangular was most useful there. But remember, I'm prejudiced towards rectangular. Let's try this one right here, which is clearly in spherical coordinates, right? Got the rho and the theta. Uh, sorry, the rho and the phi, it has no theta. Remember what happened in the previous things when we had no x or no y? That means that the x and y was free to be anything we want. Here, the theta must be free to be anything we want. But does that help me recognize what this is? Well, I'm not sure, but let's use our triangle. Phi is this angle here. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So the cosine of phi is z over rho. So the secant of phi must be rho over z. What am I to make of this? Can I divide both sides by rho? Well, legally not, unless rho is non-zero. So I think to simplify this, I'm going to do this first. Zero equals root two rho. And then legally, zero minus root two rho is zero. Now that allows me to write z minus root two times rho is zero. This tells me that my surface is coming in two pieces. One piece is rho equals zero. Of course, rho equals zero is very simple to draw. It's just a single dot. And the other piece is z equals root two. What is z equals root two? No y, no x. That's just a plane of height root two in space. So what was this figure right here? This figure is a plane and a dot. You know, I could conveniently ignore the dot, but I don't think that's fair. So this figure right here is a combination of a plane and a dot at the origin. Uh, I could separate them. I could make this be rectangular by replacing rho with x squared plus y squared plus z squared. But if I wanted to say plane and dot in rectangular coordinates, I could just as easily say this. z equals root two. and x, y equals zero, zero. That says plane and dot also. Let's go to cylindrical coordinates. Cylindrical coordinates use the same z, right? z equals root two or r and theta equals zero and zero because that's the origin dot. Again, the rectangular coordinates, the planes seem most natural because planes are easily described in terms of single coordinates. But did you know that that was a plane when you looked at it? Okay, there's the idea. So you wanna be able to go between any two coordinate systems from any one coordinate system, the other two at the drop of a hat. It takes some practice, but it's literally just replacing names with these two triangles and simplifying. With that, we have all the tools in space that we need to start calculus. And so, let me move some papers out of the way here. I mean, we could do fancier conversion problems. We could do more practice converting, but I think it's time to talk about curves in space. This is section 3.1. This is only page three of our morning. 
because uh, we spent some considerable time in Mathematica. Okay, to talk about curves in space properly, I have to make you acknowledge some things that you need to learn about functions. Now you say, I know everything there is to know about functions. I've done functions for two semesters now in calculus. I did them beforehand. Well, that's true. But you have done different varieties of functions, whether you care to acknowledge it or not. And I want you to understand the full notion of function. Like, for example, f of x equals x squared, the very first function anyone ever showed you. That's real variable in, real variable out. You put a number in, you get a number out. For that reason, people say that this is a real valued function. That's the number you get out of a real variable. That means in English, real number in, real number out. Negative seven, 49, two, four, zero, zero. That's the function that you've traditionally understood. By the way, it is not silly for me to insist on the real numbers here. So why did you say real numbers? I could put complex numbers in here, right? Put in an I, get out a minus one. You've dealt with the complex numbers before. In fact, you'd have to be faced with that if you went on in mathematics. You've done calculus in the real numbers. Can you do calculus in the complex numbers? Yes, you can, but it takes another learning. It's something you would do if you really want to study math, you're a mathematics major, say a third or fourth year course in mathematics, you'd study complex calculus that people call that complex variables or complex analysis. Calculus done in the complex realm. In some ways, it gets easier. Okay, now let's talk about this. The next step we're gonna take is, what if I put a real number in and got a vector out? This would be called a vector valued function. of a real variable. Maybe you say, well, I've only formally learned vectors since we started talking in this class. No, but you have done vector valued functions before. You called them parametric curves. If I say three cos t, two sine t, as t ranges from zero to two pi, you've done this in pre-calculus, calculus, maybe some other places, right? This is an ellipse, plus or minus three on the x-axis, plus or minus two on the y-axis. I'm not trying to draw beautifully, but I shouldn't make excuses for a bad drawing. Isn't this a function where you put in a real number and you get out a point? But getting out a point is the same thing as getting out a vector. So they call this, when you put in one number and you get out two numbers or three numbers, that's a vector valued function of a real variable. And that's where we're going to go next in chapter three. Now you could turn that around. You could put a pair of numbers in and get a real number out. You could put three numbers in and get a real number out. How about f of x, y equals 2x plus 3y. That is a real valued function of a vector variable. Uh, we're just setting the groundwork here for chapter three. 
In other words, you put in two numbers, you get one number out. Now, what that means in this case, think about it. Every time you put in an X and Y, you get another number out. And you could recognize what this is in a second. Let's call that number you get out a Z. Well, then you've seen this equation before. If I bring the Z to the other side, what do I have? A plane. In this very simple case, I put in an X and Y, and I get out a number Z. I get a dot in space. I get a surface, and this surface, just because X and Y are only used to the first power, is a very simple surface. It's a plane. But in general, if I put in X and Y and do crazy, crazy things to it, I could get out many surfaces, right? I could get out a giant bubble in space. Well, that's a terrible bubble. I'm, whew. How about, let me try that, draw that again. Turtle shell, bubble, depending on how you want to say it, a mountain in space. That comes from associating with every point, X and Y, a height, which I could call Z. But if I put in three variables, X, Y, and Z, and got out a fourth variable called W, well, now think about this. If I put in two and get out one, I need three dimensions to represent that. What happens if I put in three variables and get out a fourth? I need four dimensions to represent that in a literal sense. And I don't think I'm prepared to do that. But you certainly have encountered a situation like this before. Look at the room that you're sitting in right now. Every point in the room you're sitting in right now has a temperature associated with it. If you had thousands and thousands of little full thermometers stationed throughout the room, wouldn't you understand that some of the thermometers would have a different reading than the other thermometers? The temperature in the room you are in is a function of where you are in the room, right? I could call that temperature as a function of position or the temperature above the surface of the earth as a function of position. Okay, one more step. Excuse me. Every time I shake the camera, I have this analogy in my mind that I'm poking you in the eye. That's not meant to be threatening, but I know it's just disorienting. Okay, what do we got? Real number in, real number out. Real number in, vector out. Vector in, real number out. I guess what would be the ultimate? The ultimate would be if I put a vector in and got a vector out, could I create a function that eats vectors and produces vectors? That would be exciting. Now, I can think of the input as a vector or a position. So I could think of this input as a position in space, let's call it X, Y, and Z. And what would a vector output look like? A vector output must be an arrow, a vector, right? Now, and this is gonna to get too cluttered, so I'm not gonna to try to draw it. What if every point in space had a little arrow attached to it? I could literally say that every point in space has an arrow attached to it. And there'd be an X position of that arrow and a Y position of that arrow and a Z position of that arrow. I'm doing this much too tight. F of X, Y, and Z, G of X, Y, and Z, H of X, Y, and Z. In other words, this arrow's orientation could itself be a function of its x, y, and z position. Again, I can use computer graphics to help me understand that better, but I can 
also use just a simple analogy. Let's go back to the analogy of the room you are in. In the room you are in currently, air is flowing. In the room I am in currently, air is flowing. Not very much air, or at least not flowing very much. But you know that the air in my room has a different direction and speed of flow based on what? Where it is in the room. In the corners of the room I'm at right now, I don't think there's very much airflow, not in magnitude nor in direction. But I could represent in my room, if I could put up tiny, tiny post-it note arrows, what? I could represent an arrow for every point in this room showing you the direction and magnitude of the airflow. Maybe if I had a fan in the office, I would have a little more airflow. Some places in the office have a lot of airflow, like the space directly in front of my mouth. Air is shooting out of there once in a while. Sometimes it's shooting in. I have to stop to take a breath once in a while. Well, let's combine that with temperature. The temperature of the air in front of my mouth is probably higher than the temperature of the air near the floor of this room, which is certainly lower than the temperature of the near the top of this room. Do you see it's not hard to imagine that with a position I could associate a vector and that could be the flow of air, the flow of water, the flow of electricity, the flow of magnetism, the flow of goods and services. Vectors can be anything. Now this is called a vector valued function. Of a vector variable. So this would be in some sense like the ultimate. So I just want you to expand your notion of what functions can be. Functions can be a lot. In this case where you have vector in and vector out, most people to honor the vector that comes out, puts a vector hat on that function name to warn you this is a vector function. Same thing up here. When a vector is the output, most people put a vector hat on the function to warn people that the output of the function is a vector. That's real number in, vector out, real number in, vector out. Vector in, vector out. Okay, so which of these four are we going to do? We're going to concentrate on curve and space. And that means we're concentrating on a vector valued function. of a real variable. And by convention over the years, let's just start, let's call our curve C. We can call our curve anything. We called our lines L, but we can call the line Q if we want to. Let's say a curve C is a vector valued function of a parameter t. And let me do this in space. Let's say I have x of t, y of t, and z of t. Now, I used very meaningful letters, right? Because I want to bring things to your mind. T is usually representing time. That's, I could use T to represent time, but don't be prejudiced. T could be any parameter, but I'm very often interested in using time as a parameter. In that sense, time becomes a fourth dimension of a sense, right? How am I usually interested in describing position in terms of X, Y, and Z coordinates? So here's a vector in space x, y, and z, and I'm telling you the x and y and z depend on time. 
The fifth letter here is R. R is traditional letter for position. Physics, engineering context. So what I'm describing to you here is the position of a particle, a plane, a spaceship, a baseball, is a function of time. And at any time I can describe to you its X position, Y position, Z position, then I know the whole path of that baseball, that spaceship, or that airplane. Let me draw a schematic picture here so I can start to tempt you with some questions. So I'm gonna draw a relatively large X and Y and Z axis. Label them X, Y, and Z. I'm using the coordinates as X, Y, and Z too. So you could say I'm double naming them, right? But if you get really hung up on that, then I'll just call this the X axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis. So you don't get upset about double naming things, but usually we don't spend the time to write axis three times. Now let's take an airplane flying through space or a fly flying through the room you're in. Well, flies can have very erratic paths. So I don't think I want to get too crazy once in a while, but I, at the beginning, I think I do want to evoke twisting and turning in your mind though. So I'm going to come around here and say, oh, flying, circling. I'll use this going behind by breaking the line. But what I really meant to do to you is help you visualize a wire in space. Let's call this curve C. And every point on this curve can be described by an X position, a Y position, and a Z position. And I can describe the time which I arrive at that position. Whether I call this a point or whether I identify it as the vector R is really kind of artificial. I could just say R is the vector that like a pencil draws this path, right? We can use that analogy of a extendable pencil in space drawing this path. Now, let's talk about some of our vocabulary words. So here's our goal, orientation. Our goal is to know every single thing that's possible to know about this curve in space. And we're actually gonna be spectacularly successful. But at the beginning, things look kind of abstract, like just a piece of wire in space. What am I supposed to know about it? Well, sometimes it's bending more. Sometimes it's bending less. Sometimes it's twisting more. Sometimes it's twisting less. Is there a difference between bending and twisting? Yes, there is. But we're going to have to express that mathematically to tell you the difference. If I'm flying a plane along this path, or if there's a fly in the room following this path, sometimes the fly is going faster. Sometimes the fly is going slower. If this was a fighter jet, you know that sometimes the plane is going, the fighter jet is going faster or slower. Do you know that when the fighter jet is going very fast, but in a straight line, is different than the, when the fighter jet is slightly slower, but executing a tight turn. What happens when a fighter jet or an airplane executes a very tight turn, even at reduced speed? The force that the pilot feels is quite significant. It's called the G-force. And it could be enough to cause the pilot, the human in the plane to black out because humans have physical limitations. Okay, so we have twisting, we have turning, we have forces, 
wherever there's a force, Newton said, there was an acceleration. We have velocity. What is velocity but the combination of speed and direction? At this point right here, we have a velocity. But is the plane going upwards on the paper or downwards on the paper? I can't answer any of these questions until I introduce an orientation. So here's what I'm going to do. This curve is x, y, and z for short, but it has to exist over a time interval, right? Let's examine our plane over a time interval from A to B. And let's say at A, the plane is over here. And let's say at B, the plane is over here. Do you know what happens as soon as I take those readings? I establish an orientation on the path. I establish that the plane is flying in that direction. So as I come up to this point right here, the plane is flying in that direction. So at that moment, the plane is facing in that direction. It has a velocity in that direction. And the velocity is composed of, remember, Every vector is its magnitude times its direction. The velocity is composed of the speed and the direction. The unit vector here is called the direction of the vector v, and the magnitude of the vector v, the magnitude of velocity, is called speed. Now you acknowledge that speed and velocity are two different things. I mean, you knew that. But I want to tell you, when I say we're going to know every single thing there is to know about this curve, there are many, many things to know about this curve. So I have orientation. I have velocity. I have speed. What else would I like to know about this curve? You could rattle off many, many questions, right? Uh, a very natural question is, how long is it? Is a piece of wire from A to B. How long is that piece of wire? Go to your garage, take out some 12 gauge household wire and bend a little path out of it. How long is that path? That's called length. And again, if I was flying an airplane, length would be really important to me because I would somehow First of all, I got to learn how to spell length. I would somehow want to know uh, the distance I've traveled, length or distance, because I need to know if I have enough fuel in the plane. Okay, velocity, speed, length. Let's look at this point right here. I'm just orienting you to words right now. I will give you more meaning to the word shortly. And that's really in section 3.2. But 3.1 is just telling you how to make yourself aware of all the things that are happening. What about this plane right now, this moment that I've picked out and drawn? It certainly has a velocity, right? But do you see it's turning? What did Newton's laws say? An object in motion will continue in that same motion unless it's acted on by a force. This plane is not going in a straight line. There must be a force acting on this plane. And what was Newton's other laws? I mean, Newton's got his laws, right? And I always forget which one's first, second, and third. So I'm not gonna worry about that. But Newton said, if there's a force acting on an object, it causes an acceleration. Or vice versa, if you are experiencing an acceleration, you must be acted on by a force. So in order to turn this plane, I have to be accelerating it in some way. Maybe to bank here to the left, I've got to be accelerating that plane. And acceleration is a vector. So I'm interested in learning about the acceleration of that curve. You see, we're going to compile quite a long list. But I can show you how to calculate acceleration. Here's position. Velocity is just the rate of change of position. So 
if you want to know the velocity of an object, all you have to do is differentiate the position function with respect to time. And you've done this much, maybe in a science class. Well, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, which makes it the second derivative of position. This is the first time I've referred to calculus. Is it? Well, just about, at least it seems that way. Now, I'm talking about differentiating. I'm talking about vectors. How do I differentiate a vector? So if I want to calculate the velocity, and then we hinted at this earlier in the day, technically all I have to do is differentiate the x, y, and z slots separately. This is the convenience of rectangular coordinates. The rate of change of position is the rate of change in the x direction, rate of change in the y direction, rate of change in the z direction as a vector. These three rates of change make up the rate of change of position. So the fact that I can do calculus one slot at a time, what does that mean? That means I can use all my calculus knowledge one slot at a time. And the acceleration will be the second derivative of x, y, and z. Okay, so I have velocity, speed. Speed must be the magnitude of velocity. I want you to think about you flying this plane. You know you're facing forward and going a certain speed. You being pulled to that direction. That's the direction your plane is banking. And then you have a problem called twisting. As a pilot, you think you're always sitting upright in your seat. Well, you think that at the same time you're upside down, you know. Go think original Top Gun, where Tom Cruise was upside down over the Russian MiG. Well, in the acceleration that they were executing, maybe that pilot felt they were right side up, but they are actually upside down. So another thing you are interested in, if you're flying in a plane, is which way is up? Maybe casually right now, I could call that uprightness. Although that doesn't sound like a very scientific word. And the second thing you say is uprightness, that's silly. Uprightness is the way I'm standing right now on the earth. But you know that doesn't make any sense. If you're in a roller coaster, you don't feel that upright is vertical to the earth. Upright is the opposite of the direction you're being pressed into your seat. Why? Because you're experiencing a significant force. So if I want to talk about uprightness, and we will do this, we'll give it a fancier name, but what I could do, I need a vector that represents me sitting in my seat, and it's perpendicular to the direction I'm facing, and it's perpendicular to the direction I'm turning, very hard to represent that in this picture because I've run out of colors, but maybe it's a vector that's perpendicular to both of these vectors. We're not ready to do this yet. And this is not the explanation, but if I cross velocity and acceleration, I can later create a notion of uprightness but I'm gonna to have to carefully define that for you later. But if you're flying a plane, uprightness is critical. There's one last story and then we'll let you go to show you how critical that is. Go Google what happened to JFK Jr. Now this happened quite some time ago, JFK Jr., son of the former president of the United States, died in an airplane accident. JFK Jr. was piloting his own airplane. And the airplane crashed, I believe, into the ocean off the East Coast. So what happened? There was no storm. This person was a 
fair pilot, but he was not instrument rated to fly at night. He had not done enough hours logging. You got many, many, many steps to becoming a pilot. You can be a pilot where you can do visual flight rules. Like, okay, you're in the daytime, you have orientation, you have horizon, and you're allowed to fly the plane in the daytime under these conditions. To be allowed to fly a plane at night is different. To be allowed to fly a plane under adverse conditions is different. In the daytime on the earth, you have a notion of horizontal and you can see the horizon and use that as a reference point. But what happens at night? That horizon is gone. And what happens at night when you don't have the horizon and your plane is slightly tilted? Well, you're going to be experiencing an acceleration. And the acceleration is going to be pressing you into your seat. You're going to be banking the same way you're banking when you get off the freeway, right? And you feel the pressing into your seat. And for that reason, you feel like you're upright, but you're not actually upright. So the best and simplest explanation I can give you, and you can go and review the actual reports and things like that, is not being rated to fly at night. He was not reading his instruments correctly or not acknowledging his instruments. And sometimes pilots can get disoriented. The instruments are telling you, whoa, 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 you're not horizontal. Your body is telling you you're horizontal. So it's most likely what happened is that he was slightly off horizon. He was slightly off horizontal and he was slowly banking always thinking he was traveling in a straight line, but slowly banking in a great large circle until he descended and descended and struck the ocean. Now, this is much too simple of an explanation of a complex event, right? But I want to tell you, horizon is really important to you. Horizon is very critical. Uprightness is very important. Okay, so this is the path we're going to take, and this is where we're going to cut it off today. We're going to learn everything there is to know about curves in space. We're going to show you how to calculate all these things and more, things that we need to know if we're going to pilot an aircraft, or even if we're going to take a satellite or a spaceship away from the influence of gravity. How do you calculate paths of things like that? Okay, you guys got one more homework to do tonight. It's a little bit of a challenge to describe the intersection of those two surfaces and the curve that results. Do your best you can. Let me see what you can do. Send me a question if you have a question. But you guys have an excellent weekend, and I will see you next week.